Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. In November, members of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta will be gathering in Edmonton for their annual fall convention. This year brings a significant change. As after years of dedicated service to the municipal organization, Panoka County Reeve Paul McLaughlin steps down as president. Now, as candidates announce their bids for the RMA presidency, we will speak with those candidates about their leadership styles, their vision for the organization, and how they intend to guide Alberta's rural municipalities into the future. Today, we are joined by Councillor John Burroughs of Woodland County and currently Director of District 3 for RMA. We will hear about his aspirations to lead the rural municipalities of Alberta. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and talking about your bid to become the next president of the rural municipalities of uh, of Alberta. <laughs> so I've got to start at the beginning, and it's why did you decide to put your name in the hat? Well, I've uh, I've got a little different experience, I think, than some some folks. Uh, I've I've actually lived in a few different provinces in Canada. Uh, and I saw Alberta as having a clear advantage over many of the different provinces. So I've, I've actually lived and done business in northwestern Ontario, Manitoba, northern BC, and, uh, and ended up uh, in uh, McMurray. So I've lived in Fort McMurray. I was up there for five years, which uh, uh, was an interesting experience. That was when the, when the big boom was going on. And uh then I moved down to Woodlands County, and I've been here ever since. So, in the in the over twenty five years I've been in in Alberta, though, what I've seen is that we are starting to fall prey to some of the issues that you're seeing in other provinces, and specifically, that's getting political. Uh, when you're when you're looking back and forth between what's going on right now, uh, you know, the energy prices are all Danielle's fault, or the energy prices are all the NDP's fault. And I think that uh, we've entered that political sphere and the RMA's path is going to be extremely important in the next little while because they, they can actually offer the completely nonpartisan practical solutions that we're going to need to build a successful province, not just rural Alberta, uh, but work together with urbans and build a, a successful province. And I, I think that's absolutely key. And, and that's something that RMA has done all along you would be taking over the presidency at a very uh, contentious time uh, for municipalities. When I speak to member municipalities across the province, rural leaders, they talk about the concerns. What in your background gives you belief that you would be the best person to lead the organization during a time of great growth, but also great challenges within the rural municipalities of Alberta? Well, we have in in the county that I was elected to in in 2017, and I served four years as the Reeve here as well. Um, we were kind of a canary in a coal mine for some of the issues that were were hitting Alberta. And you and I a while ago did a, a an interview on unpaid taxes where we were out 11 million dollars. And I know this is probably going to come up later on, but the uh, the reality is we were in a revenue crunch and we had to deal with some very creative ways to get out of it. And we've done a good job in that. We've still got an infrastructure deficit that we've got to deal with, but these changes need to be, you need to be careful on the, on the course corrections that you, 
you don't make them too quickly uh, because it, it winds up in an unstable environment for business. And Alberta is has always been, and this is the thing that I think is very different about Alberta, is that government was typically fairly small. Government regulated it and private industry did it. Uh, that is that needs to stay in Alberta. And uh, the, the reality is that what we need is a stable regulatory land development all the way from the provincial to the municipal uh, end of things where business can look at it and say, yes, this is a good investment. We're investing in Alberta. Let's talk and about, I, oil. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go, go ahead. I was going to say, let's talk about unpaid oil and gas property taxes for a few seconds here. Um, because uh, as I often joke, there's two things I can rely on every year, and that is my taxes, and that RMA is going to send me a news release saying that unpaid property, oil and gas property taxes are continuously going up, and the result means that municipal leaders in rural communities are going to have to bear the brunt, and that means property taxes or cuts of services. What do you think that RMA's role should be in helping address this issue and getting the province to finally take this seriously? I was speaking to Lane Monteith up in Big Lakes County, and his municipality this year is $9 million. That's $9 million shortfall for his municipality. And that's just one municipality. RMA released mm -hmm. a news release saying $300 million is owed to rural municipalities to, from these unpaid oil and gas taxes. How can we solve this issue as a borough's presidency? Well, there's one other thing that I want to capture in this that often goes un unnoticed because I don't think they're very well represented, and that's the uh, the land the land use uh, the land leases. Sorry, and if you look at the amount of money that the uh, provincial government is dumping in to cover some of those land leases, it is a tr it's millions and millions of dollars for some of those unpaid land leases. And, you know, rural properties are the ones that are specifically impacted by that. They need to get paid. The agreements are there. The municipalities, that's a source of revenue for them. You need to pay your taxes. So the, uh, and again, I think uh, Woodlands was a canary in a coal mine for this. We actually were the one that put the resolution forward to RMA to really start advocating on this because we were one of the first that suffered this through Trident and Trident was a, you know, a huge issue. Uh, the the minister we thought we had it right up until the last ministerial order came out that allowed the uh, the AER to transfer licenses without unpaid uh, taxes being covered. Uh, it would have been nice if, at the very least, they put in the ministerial order that those wells that they're going to transfer needed to have their taxes paid. Uh, there, that would at least recover a portion, and I think they should have done that. But you know, I, I like I said, I. I've I've got a few ideas, and I don't know that I don't I don't think RMA would necessarily uh, in, involve itself in this. I'm not sure how they would involve themselves in this because and it's it, it would be touchy. But um, I think I can see because this is a provincial issue now; it's not affecting one municipality. You might actually be able to do something along the lines of working with the AER, the Orphan Well Association, and um, municipalities where. A group of municipalities could set up, for lack of a better term, a cooperative where uh, they actually take, and, let, and I'm just going to speak in very broad numbers, but they take, let's say there's 100 properties, and you've actually got a business case for 10 of them continuing to operate. That municipal co-op might be able to take those 10 productive wells that are actually producers and, and money makers, operate those until the taxes are paid, and then put it back on the market as a as a, a sale. It's kind of out there. It's a it's a bit of a different idea. But if the province is not going to solve this problem for us, I think rural municipalities might have to band together and solve it themselves. And in that, we could also do something along the lines to sweeten the pot, where we could, if there are a hundred wells, we take ten good producers. We could also abandon ten. Uh, so we take something off the plate of the of the Orphan Well Association. It's good for it's good for the province. It's good for the municipalities. Uh, it's good for your service industries that are in the in the area. And on the unpaid tax thing that I really want to want to put out is with uh, the Trident bankruptcy. What we saw here in in Woodlands was that we had a, a lot of 
local companies that were doing business with these companies that couldn't pay their taxes, if they can't pay their taxes and they probably are not going to be able to provide or pay their service providers. So you have in effect, and Paul very articulately referred to them as zombie companies. Uh, you have these companies acting like um, a gravity well, a black hole, and they're actually pulling healthy companies down with them that are located in these rural and, and uh, urban municipalities that are, you know, the small towns that are that are in in the the rural municipalities. So you're bankrupting the the people that actually back your community. And those are the ones that put the hockey jerseys on the kids' backs. They're the ones that do the community lunchbox programs. Those small businesses are the community. And those are the ones that need to be looked out for. I don't, I don't really uh, feel bad for companies that are offshoring money right now and not Canadian-owned companies. So I want to turn to something you just talked about as well, and that is sort of the infrastructure. Funding is very important for a lot of rural municipalities. I was talking to Murray Carrick at the FCM conference earlier this year. He is the reeve of the Lesser Slave River, Municipal District of Lesser Slave River, or if you, they call it Lesser Slave River. And he was talking about how one of his bridges is costing $2 million to repair. And they don't have the money as they traditionally did to repair those that have been downloaded upon them by the province. How do you see yourself working with the province to address some of this infrastructure backlog? Because when you talk to Minister McIver or even the Premier, they say, you're already getting enough. We know you're going to ask for more, but we only have a certain amount of money we can give you as well. So again, RMA led the led the charge on that, and I was just before the interview, I was reading the uh, the bridge infrastructure deficit, and so the current number I think is two point three around two point three billion dollars, and and I I I, I want to put this one in perspective. If you were paid a dollar a second, it would take you eleven years, sorry, eleven days to get to a million dollars. Okay. If you're paid a dollar a second, it would take you 31.7 years to get to a billion. So, you know, a hundred thousand to a million doesn't seem like that big of a step in today's economy, but a million to a billion is a lot. And I, I think that needs to be put in perspective. So, yeah, there is a huge uh, infrastructure deficit that's going on. But I also was at uh, AB Muni's conference. And if you looked at all of their resolution, every resolution was coming to the province for more money and uh, more funding. So I think province wide, we're in a we're in a bit of a cash crunch. And the the biggest thing that we can do right now is seek some new development and uh, and see how things go from there. We are definitely going to have to to get some provincial support on the bridge uh, infrastructure, though. One of the roles as RMA president, you'll be dealing with the province on a regular basis, whether that be the premier, whether that be the, one of the ministers. Can you call a spade a spade in front of someone's face when you know that something is not good for municipalities or something that is good for municipalities and you'll work with them? But will you be able to call them out and say, this will not work for our member municipalities? So uh, one one very at the moment, I thought it was an embarrassing uh, type of thing that we had to deal with was uh, Paul introduced us at the Rural Municipalities Convention as uh, kind of superheroes. And he had us come up on stage and he introduced me as analogy man. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do is you leave the issue that if you talk specifically about the issue, it tends to uh, generate a lot of um, a lot of emotion. Uh, if you can find an analogy that goes right alongside specifically that particular issue, you can take the emotion out of it and you can start to see just the facts of it and how silly some positions can be. And then, yes, so yes, I can call a spade a spade. And uh, I, I think the way that I typically do that is by making those analogies and trying to get the bigger picture. And like I said, uh, you know, that comment that I made about the the local companies that that put the backs on, the, sorry, put the uh, jerseys on the back of the kids and support the local community programs. That's that's something that you you don't really hear about when you talk to the province. 
one of the other areas that uh, I just want to jump into this last issue before we turn to the role of presidency, if you don't mind. And mm -hmm. it's an issue that I've been hearing from from Northern Reeves and Southern Reeves. I spoke to the mayor, the Reeve of Northern Sunrise County, Corina Williams, and the mayor of the Reeve, sorry, of Tabor, uh, the MD of Tabor. And I'm, I always pronounce her name incorrectly, so I'm not even going to try. I just know her first name is Tamara. So Tamara, I apologize for incorrectly <laughs> announcing your name. But one of the issues that they are concerned about is victim services units. And that impacts a lot of rural municipalities where do you see RMA playing a role in advocating for keeping the former structure and not moving to the more centralized structure that the province wants to implement or is implementing as we're speaking? Yeah, and that, that's a really difficult one because they are so far down the road on this already. They've already disbanded a lot of them. So to make them take a back step on this one, it, that's going to be really tricky. Um, and I... I, I guess that's why when I was talking about our province becoming like a lot of other provinces, you're starting to see this political push and pull that's going on. And I mean, how do you have a conservative government, quote unquote, conservative government that is starting to centralize? So that that's not that's not a conservative principle. Generally, they they like to keep things small and they like to keep things local. And I, I think that was a winning formula for Alberta. Uh, and I think that we need to stay with that formula. So I, and I absolutely agree the the centralization of the victim services, I, I would definitely support moving back to the old model. And the reality is that they, they changed the entire system for about half a dozen municipalities that weren't being supplied. Uh, and if this is the way that they look at problems uh, from correcting problems, I guess, is to centralize everything that's, you know, there's six outliers on. Uh, that's not a path forward for the province. So I, I would definitely support coming back to the old model, but we are a long way down the road on this at the provincial level. So it, that's a really tough question. We, we certainly are. I want to turn to the organization as a whole and RMA as a whole. Along along with advocacy work as the next president, you will also be working with RMA, which is growing at a substantial amount with the new procurement file, with the organization just moving into their brand new facility. What's your vision for RMA as a whole? RMA as a whole, and I kind of touched on this earlier, has to be that very pragmatic, very practical a source of solutions and unbiased data. And I think they've done an amazing job of doing that. Uh, and under Paul's tenure, the, the the growth of some of the business services and, and other services that we offer, uh, that enables us to hire more staff to do more advocacy. So we've actually, in the last one and a half years, have gone from uh, three directors uh, to, sorry, three full-time staff plus one director in advocacy to six plus two senior staff in advocacy. And now we're able to take on also a federal role. So we, we've been outstanding in developing that advocacy and developing more ability and more capacity within the RMA. And Paul can take a lot of that credit, certainly, because he's been uh, he's been really pushing the, the company forward so that we can do these, these uh, other services. And, and again, like I said, the uh, the practical solutions need to come from an, uh, a nonpartisan organization. We've never picked sides. We're we're all about making sure that Alberta is successful, and a successful Alberta means a successful rural Alberta. You mentioned Paul McLaughlin a few times, and you'd be taking over from him as the next president if elected in November. How will your presidency differ from Paul McLaughlin's presidency? And yes, I've asked this to all the other candidates. So this is not a John question. This is all because yeah. some people might want someone different than what Paul has offered for the last few years. How does your presidency, how would your presidency differ from his? You know, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think two years ago I sat at the, at the conference and I was watching Paul and I've been on the board um, three and a half years, well, three years now. Um, but uh, I was watching Paul and, uh, and I, I even crossed behind him at one point and, and glanced at the, at the podium. I wanted to see what he was looking at. 
And there was not a stick, not a piece of paper on the podium. There was nothing. He was, everything was off the cuff. And I sat back down at the table and I said, man, I pity the poor guy that's got to follow up that, that, that kind of, uh, you know, MC ability and, and communicative skill. Um, and now here I am putting my name forward. So yeah, it's, it's going to be different. Um, but I, I think that, uh, I think that, like I said, I, I want to keep that long-term vision for Alberta as being, um, you know, open for business, small, pragmatic government, and it doesn't matter which party's in power, you've got to work with whoever's, whoever's there. And this is the reality of where we're at. So I, I think we're going to have to do a, uh, some pretty interesting communications and, uh, you know, I'll be working overtime on my analogies. Which is good to hear because I'm, I'm the king of analogies on this show as well. Um, yeah. Okay. The role of RMA presidency is not something that is a part-time role. You're going to be uh, crisscrossing this province, speaking to your members. You're going to be doing a lot of advocacy work. You're going to also be sitting on the board of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which meets in Ottawa and advocates on Ottawa issues for your province. You are also a counselor for your own community. Can you, are you able to give full-time work effort to all these different aspects of being a president, being a counselor, being in Ottawa when you need to be, when FCM calls? Well, when I, when I ran for RMA, I knew that there, there was going to be a substantial commitment to RMA and I actually parked my, my business for the, the time being. So I'm, I'm, I've set that aside for right now and invested my time in in the RMA and in being a counselor. And at the time that I got onto RMA, I was the Reeve. Uh, now, as a counselor for Woodlands rather than the Reeve, I think I'm going to have more time to devote to those types of opportunities. My my uh, daughter uh, officially moved out, and uh, she's on her own. And uh, I don't have uh, a, a better half at home anymore. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've definitely got the time and I've got the, uh, the will to do it. I'm, and I'm looking forward to it. I, I really think that uh, I, I think that Alberta is the best province in the entire country. And, and rural Alberta is the core of everything. All the resources flow from rural Alberta. What's priority number one for you on day one? If you win on a November 7th, what's going to be priority number one for you? Priority number one, I think, is going to have to be that unpaid tax uh, end of things because there is there is a revenue crunch. that, And again, this is, this is an observation that I've made. The developments overall, market assessment, market growth, um, real development that's going on in Alberta in general, and not all municipalities are in this in this mess, but some of them are. And uh, you're seeing you're seeing a service level that we're at and an infrastructure deficit that we're at that's going to require significant revenue generation. So the idea that you can have oil companies operating with unpaid taxes is unacceptable, and that is a source of revenue that benefits all Alberta and it needs to be solved some way or another. My last question for you before I let you go, because I know you are a busy person and I have taken up 25 minutes of your time already, but why should the members of RMA, the members who vote at this upcoming fall convention vote John Burroughs as the next president of RMA president? Well, I don't think that uh, this isn't this isn't a job that you're doing on your own. You're actually working with a huge team of extremely capable and competent, uh, dedicated individuals that are part of the RMA group. And everybody that I talk to there is dedicated to what they do. They are uh, able to to answer your calls at the drop of a hat. They're willing to work with whatever. Uh, crazy idea I come up with, and uh, and it's interesting because, uh, like I said, that you're the leader of that team, and uh, I'm not going to be an expert on all the issues on absolutely everything that comes my way, and I'm going to have to lean on that team, and I think that's something that I'm I'm 
quite good at is taking a problem, breaking it down, making it, you know, when we talk about these uh, quote unquote wicked problems, right? A wicked problem is something that you don't see a, an easy solution to at all. There's no, there's no solution. We've, uh, we've got to deal with some of these more simple issues and then uh, start getting creative on some of the, the wicked problems that Alberta is seeing. But this isn't, uh, um, and I think the other thing that, that's important too is that one of the things that I realized when I was dealing with a lot of the ICF, uh, the intermunicipal collaborative framework issues that were going on, uh, some of that legislation needs to be looked at. And the entire, almost all municipalities, and again, with what I witnessed at the uh, AB Muni's conference, all of the municipalities right now are suffering from revenue generation issues, and they have huge infrastructure deficits. Uh, the city of Calgary is, it's no surprise, the, the reason that the, uh, the water main systems are failing is because a lot of Alberta was built in the 70s and 80s, and we are clocked out on the age of that infrastructure. We built so much of it at one time that we don't have, we don't have steps for it failing. It was, it was so developed so quickly that a lot of it is the same age. So you're going to see that revenue problem across the province, and we're going to have to get creative as both rural and urban uh, to work together to, to solve some of these revenue problems. You, you can't make your revenue problem uh, another municipality's issue. So I, I think that that's the big thing and, and leading the team. John? Councillor, I want to thank you so much. Uh, I, I know uh, it is hard to take time out of a busy campaign to sit down and talk to a show like mine, but I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this because uh, I think democracy only helps, only works when you get your message out. So hopefully we can get your message out and people will take a look at all the candidates, including yourself, for this year's upcoming RMA presidency. I, I really appreciate you doing this, and uh, I do want to say, since I, I've seen you start up uh, doing this type of, uh, you know, small media type of, of organization and the amount of effort and energy that you put into it and passion, you're obviously very passionate about this, and you have been, um, you've been very unbiased in, in what you've been doing, too. I, I see a true journalist, so thank you uh -huh. for what you do as well. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Municipal Affairs. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of the candidates running to be the next president of RMA. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to this. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button today so you never miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more important conversations like you heard today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Municipal Affairs. Till then.